Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Aisha. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Intimacy Directing for Theater, book release number two. <laughs> Woo -woo. Woo -hoo. <laughs> if you joined us for part one, welcome back. If this is your first time with us, we are so happy to have you here. And I'm really just excited to uh, just have these readings by these amazing contributors today. So I would love to get us started by just asking if you are so inclined wherever you are, if you could just go ahead and uh, I'd like to do an opening practice. If you could tap, if you could tap in with us, it's just um, an inhale up and exhale down, okay? And we can do it together, all right? So nice deep inhale. Nice clap. Exhale down. Beautiful, okay. Wherever you are in the world, I just want to uh, welcome you. And I am right now, I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana. And so I would really like to acknowledge that. I want to honor this land. And I know that uh, I wouldn't be able to do my work if it wasn't for those who came before me. And so please feel free if you would like to, to also acknowledge where you are in the web chat or contributors. You can also just put it in the Zoom chat box. Uh, yeah, feel free to put your acknowledgement. So I want to begin with this land acknowledgement, the Choctaw, Huma, and Chitamara, and Biloxi, and other native peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. The city of New Orleans was not built upon virgin soil, but merely served as a continuation of a great indigenous hub known to Choctaw as Babancha, the place of other tongues. For thousands of years, people lived along the Mississippi River and Babancha served as a place for diverse cultures to come together. I hope that the social justice work that we are doing here this afternoon and in our daily lives, wherever we are right now, pays respects to and honors the Native American legacy of this land. Great, and so for our lineup for today, we hope to, uh, first we're going to have uh, Marie Piercy, and then we're gonna have Colin Hughes, and then I'm gonna share a chapter, and then we're gonna go into Q&A. We hope to have at least a half an hour in Q&A, Q &A, and we hope to wrap up at about, uh, it'll be 2.30 my time, Central Standard, and 3.30 Eastern Standard time. Uh, please, we would love your questions and comments. So if you have any questions or comments, please put it into the web chat and we will be able to address them during our Q&A. So intimacy directing for theater, creating a culture of consent in the classroom and beyond. Why here? Why now? Because we are doing the work, we are hiring professionals, we are trying to get certificates, we are doing professional development, and we are trying to push forward uh, consent-based work as much as we can. And so this book is for teachers who are artists and artists who are teachers and in no way replaces hiring uh, a, an, an intimacy director, an intimacy uh, coordinator, but it really gives some foundational tips and strategies and detailed exercises for teachers in the classroom to get started. So with that being said, I would love to start off with introducing Marie Percy, a colleague of mine actually years ago when I first started my certification, uh, Marie was uh, one of the teachers. And so I've really been impacted by her work. I just wanna remind everyone to, uh, if you could just mute, I'm hearing some feedback. So if anyone is unmuted. Um, so Marie Percy is an intimacy director, certified Laban movement analyst, yoga teacher, and movement director based in Connecticut. She currently serves as IDC's chief creative officer and oversees all curricula and educational offerings at IDC, intimacy directors and coordinators. She has spent over 10 years training actors in an academic setting 
and her students can be seen performing in national tours, national commercials, regional theaters, and beyond. Feel free to contact Marie for intimacy work by just going straight to the IDC's website. So why don't we give it up for Marie Piercy? My sound was off, but I was saying thank you so much, Dr. Ayesha, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. I'm going to start at the beginning of the chapter that I wrote for Dr. Ayesha's book. It is chapter 10, and it's titled Actor Training and Consent in the Movement Classroom. So we're going to dive right in. Actor training is a vulnerable process. Unlike other art forms, the student actor's medium is themselves, body, heart, and mind. Pressure to make performances as real as possible can make it difficult for new actors to distinguish notes on a performance from criticisms of their personhood and identity. They are asked to take bold risks, always say yes, and fail gloriously with body, heart, and mind all on the line. Many students emerge into the professional world having gained self-knowledge, confidence, and other valuable creative skills. However, many students will also experience harm due to boundary crossing pedagogical practices. Students are unable to say no and may feel that they risk being perceived as difficult, resistant, or not suited to be an actor if they speak up. Real harm is unwittingly done to student actors who are unable to clearly communicate their boundaries and protect themselves. Got Your Back's 2018 national survey highlights the very real dangers inherent in actor training. Only 15% of students felt confident that they could turn down a role that was assigned to them if it involved something they were not comfortable with. Half of students of color felt limited in casting because of their perceived race. Nearly half of students experienced considerable mental health problems during their training with a fourfold increase in the worst mental health issues. 70% of students felt a teacher's methods were reckless towards student mental health. Less than half of students who were asked to perform fully or partially undressed felt able to say no. And 81% of students were required to take part in exercises, scenes, or plays, which required them to engage in kissing or other physical intimacy with a partner. Half of the respondents did not have the ability to opt out. These statistics demonstrate the real harm that real harm is being done in acting training programs and that students dignity identity personhood and mental health are all under attack. I have witnessed and experienced similar trends in the 10 years I have been training actors in American BFA and MFA programs I began teaching movement for actors at 25. And as a young white Latina woman teaching among older white male academics, I identified more with my students' experiences than my colleagues. Students dealt with tremendous pressure, overloaded schedules, and the fear of disappointing anyone, and they often dragged themselves into my class exhausted and unprepared. Teaching is like trying to push a string across a table. It simply doesn't work if the student on the other side isn't pulling the string toward them. The more power, agency, acknowledgement of their humanity, and structured freedom I gave my students, the more they prioritized their work in my class despite their busy schedule. I rediscovered what Bell Hooks had written about engaged pedagogy and its emphasis on well being. To teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students is essential if we are to provide the necessary conditions where learning can most deeply and intimately begin. The greatest gift you can give your students is agency over themselves. 
As a woman movement expert with whom many students felt safe and heard, I was often asked to choreograph intimacy for our departmental productions. I attended Intimacy Director International's first pedagogy intensive in 2018 and found that my pedagogical and choreographic approach dovetailed perfectly with what I learned there. Engaged and transgressive pedagogy are complementary to the foundations of best practices for intimacy, and together they can be exponentially transformative. What follows in this chapter comes directly from my professional experience and my ongoing collaborations with intimacy professionals. I argue that structural change is essential for integrating consent and bodily autonomy into the acting classroom for people of all identities. And I then analyze the necessary components for consent to exist, identify barriers to its presence in academia, and discuss pedagogical and structural changes to promote a holistic cultural shift. So my next, the next section is titled Consent as a Model for Structural Change. Many well-meaning professors approach safety and inclusivity in their classroom through a benign but privileged lens. Quote, I allow students to bring their whole selves to class. I listen and I'm empathetic. End quote. This is a particular pitfall for established white cisgendered and heteronormative male academics. It is a privilege to be able to empathize with students' struggles without also making systemic changes to foster a more inclusive consent forward learning environment. Mere empathy is not enough. During a Racial Equity Institute workshop I attended, the facilitator urged us to stop trying to pull people suffering from oppression out of the metaphorical river. Instead, we need to go upriver and figure out how are they being pushed into the river in the first place and stop pushing them into the river. Creating a culture of consent for acting students of all identities must be approached in the same way. Identify the practices systems and cultural norms that push our students in the river and find better ways to teach. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit um, and just share a couple of the bullet points that I share later in the chapter that are um, uh, like tips on how to make some of those um, structural and systemic changes and how to shift away from some of the cultural norms that cause problems. Um, so I'm going to pick a couple of the bullet points from my chapter at random now. Um, here we go. Let's see. Use specification grading or stop grading altogether. Um, grades have been established as counterproductive, diminishing student interest, and decreasing their quality of thinking. Ungrading, as Bell Hooks calls it, suggests that we do away with grades since they are counterproductive to student learning. Some alternatives include asking students to grade themselves, critical dialogue with them about their self-assessment, peer assessment, process letters, and specification grading. Set clear expectations. When setting up any exercise or scene work, let students know ahead of time what they can expect to encounter inside of that experience. Set up a container, a collection of boundaries that allows actors to work impulsively within predetermined acceptable actions. It can include what kind of touch, movement, potential, potentially traumatic topics, or interpersonal interaction is permissible or may be encountered within the exercise. Have frank conversations about the story. Who, what, when, where, why, and how must all be answered if you're doing intimate work or if there's a scene with, intimate, with an intimate moment, just in the same way we would answer those questions during table work for a scene. I'm going to do I'm going to do one more. 
Don't be a guru. When a teacher with extensive expertise encourages students to look to them for all of the answers, they leverage expert and referent power to gain influence over their students. This compounds when that teacher is working from the dominant Euro-American Western perspective with students of the global majority. The role of the master acting teacher places the locus of control outside of the student. This forces students to do as they are told because of the illusion that they can only grow by doing what the guru says. This fundamentally undermines a student's ability to consent. So I'm going to wrap my reading there, um, but there are there's more in my chapter, so I hope you'll have a chance to read the book and the work of all the other brilliant people who contribute to this wonderful book. Um, speaking of amazing people who contributed to this wonderful book, um, I would now love to introduce Colleen Hughes um, as an intimacy director and coordinator. Colleen brings a trauma-informed and human-first approach to scenes of simulated sex, nudity, and hyperexposure. Through her collaboration with trusted colleagues, she is at the vanguard of a movement to bring increased agency and transparency to the entertainment industry. She has collaborated with artists from around the globe, including Maya Hawk uh, on the official music video for Therese, Samantha Shea at the Pina Bausch Company in Germany, and immersive work with Virgin Atlantic's Cruise Line in the Mediterranean, and punk drunks Sleep No More in New York City. Colleen is currently working on a book titled, entitled A Volunteer from the Audience, Consent Work in Interactive Performance, that examines the role of agency in immersive performances. She's a treasure and a delight, and I am grateful to be able to call her a colleague. Take it away, Colleen. Uh, thank you so much, Marie. Um, I was thinking back to uh, when we were both in um, that really early Intimacy Directors International um, uh, program together, and how lovely it is to still be sharing space and learning from you. So um, thank you so much. Um, my chapter is uh, entitled, Consent, Culture, and Devised Work. Since I'm not going to be reading the whole thing, I want to just provide a quick definition for what I'm speaking about when I say the term devised work um, for folks that are not familiar with it. Um, so within the live performance field, devised work is um, uh, refers to projects that are created in large part by the performers themselves, um, still often working with directors and um, choreographers, intimacy professionals, um, and often um, other collaborators as well, like composers. Um, but on the first day of rehearsal, there is not a script in hand. Um, these processes can last anywhere from three, uh, three months to three years um, because the development process is happening with the full group in the room. And um, so that is what I'm referring to uh, when I'm speaking about devised work in this context. All right. The devised theater rehearsal space is unique. In it, performers are more than interpreters of others' words. They are source creators themselves, coining text, crafting movement, and even making structural choices throughout an extended development process. The resulting performance is one in which their contributions are indelibly molded into the final product. product. It is in this setting that I spent many of my early years as a theater professional. When I began studying to become an intimacy director, many joyfully creative rooms swirled in my mind as I began my work in consent forward practices. In the course of my time as an actor, I also worked on productions in the quote, traditional regional theater model, the three week rehearsal process in which an existing script is efficiently staged and produced. But it was not these processes that were foremost in my mind as I trained in consent and intimacy work. My thoughts went to the numerous physical theater projects that seemed to uphold so many of the ideals that intimacy and consent professionals were now working to codify. What is it about these rehearsal rooms that lifted the human first and foremost? What about the devised process opened the door 
to the possibility of seeing performers not merely as conduits, but as creators themselves. As I moved from training into practice, I wanted to see what devised work could bring to consent forward production methodology, and in turn, discover how consent and intimacy work could support this subspecialty. In these pages, I will share what I've learned from a creative perspective as I have worked to merge these two fields. What does it mean to bring this practice, consent forward work, to a rehearsal space that does not function in a standard three week rehearsal process? How can performers consent to actions within a performance that is yet to be envisioned? Despite the wealth of positive experiences that I had had working in these pr processes in Philadelphia, physical and dance theater are certainly not without their gurus and dangerous practices. So how can consent culture continue to uplift this non-traditional way of developing work without demanding that it be something that it is not? Forcing it into a space with more structure and perhaps less of that dynamic that made it feel so affirming for me all those years. How can intimacy work lift up devised work just as devised work has lifted up intimacy work? Through ongoing conversations with dance theater organizations, large and small, as well as work with intimacy directors and coordinators, I have found tools that serve many of these spaces quite well. As is always the case with works in progress, I hope and expect to have learned and built more a year from now, as well as a decade from now. But as of this writing, I am proud to be able to share some tools that have been adapted from IDI, Intimacy Directors International, and IDC intimacy practices specifically for those creating work and devised processes. The goal is to continue what is good and find ways to bring even more agency and healthful practices to the physical theater world. Boundaries, of course, have been part of the marrow of intimacy work since its inception. And we will soon break down the specific ways in which boundaries can still exist with clarity in a devised process. Prior to that list, it is essential to name that unlike oppressive systems of power that express themselves through actions that uphold white supremacy and other forms of oppression, some types of power that exist in a specific workplace, such as title power and referent power, are not inherently harmful. A producer holds the power to make the final decision as to where a production will be held. This is neither coercive nor problematic. But as I first stated in my presentation entitled Consent and Communication Practices for a Stronger Community Theater Culture, counterfactual denial of power can contribute to a coercive environment that can foster gaslighting and even abuse. This language has now been incorporated into IDC's core training on power dynamics. The re this reality is particularly important for those in devised spaces to reckon with. Unlike regional theater processes in which most people are uniquely aware of the hierarchy, it is sometimes artists in physical and dance theater spaces, often underfunded specialties, who are not always able or willing to recognize their own power within a workspace. As such, they can perpetuate harm by pretending or even believing themselves that the workspace is a flat circle of influence. This is almost always not the case. Even in communal artistic groups in which no one holds any title power or non-democratic decision-making power, referent and expert power still play a heavy role in the way in which power affects consent in the room. While we cannot wave a magic wand and make existing power dynamics disappear, we can and should look at how power is functioning in our creative spaces and take actions that help make sure that those with the least amount of it are able to express their needs and boundaries without reprisal or punishment. So now some tools. I have tools for engaging honestly with power dynamics in device processes. Hey an empowered stage manager throughout the entire rehearsal process. B, elected cast representative, clear reporting structures, community agreements, organizational stance and stated response to bullying and harassment, 
anonymous reporting options, and a professional rehearsal space when, profession when financially feasible. Even on a next to nothing budget, rehearsal in a park may be a better fit from a power dynamic perspective than a rehearsal in someone's living room. Transparency is one of the core tenets of consent forward work, but divisors might feel at a loss when looking at standard recommendations regarding communication, since their material doesn't exist before the first rehearsal process. However, by looking to share what you know when you know it, folks in leadership positions can model a culture of transparency, even when the project still has many unknowns. So tools for uplifting transparency and device processes. Audition postings with as complete as possible description of the project and what artists may expect. So some examples. This piece will include scenes with extensive acrobatics. A certified acrobatics instructor with their name and link will be working in collaboration with the choreographer and will be available to work with performers throughout the rehearsal process. Example two. Final performance will depict multiple scenes of stylized violence representing the experiences of World War I soldiers. Example three, performance will be immersive. Audience members will not be permitted to touch the performers at any time. And example four, performances will be staged outdoors unless the temperature is below 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, tools for transparency continuing. Ongoing active discussion of project development with the entire team, regular brainstorm sharing sessions. These make sure that all team members are in on the latest proposals, even if those ideas were conceived over coffee or beer or outside of rehearsal hours. Being an open communication about what story are we telling and how are we telling it. Clear lines of communication that establish expectations regarding workspace behavior, particularly when divisors have overlapping dual or multiple discrete relationships, i.e. someone is both an instructor and a performer, someone is both a mentee and a director, someone is both a collaborator and a significant other. These dynamics, which are prevalent throughout the entertainment industry, are particularly common in the highly specialized and, quote, small world of physical and dance theater. Finally, boundaries are arguably one of the foundational tools of consent forward work. The way in which they can be utilized and devised work is through a combination of methods, standard and intimacy work, as well as some variations that are specific to generative processes. So tools for uplifting boundaries and device processes. Presenting multiple options as often as possible to help facilitate a culture of personal agency. Model, expect and celebrate, no, no but, and yes if, um, and that is attributed to Marie C. Percy and Jessica Steinrock's uh, lesson, yes, no, and beyond consent and performance. Uh, ask rather than assume. Boundary check-ins as a regular part of the process, which helps to uplift consent as revocable and sincere, uh, sincere and active apology if a boundary is crossed. At times, creators working on material, uh, creators are working on material that is very close to their own experience. Some specific boundary tools that can serve these processes include conscientious word choice, potentially incorporating options such as work and colleague, a separate journal for the project, separate from a personal notebook. Noticing specific physical shifts for a character and creating a physical practice moving into and out of character body at top and end of day. Scheduling field trips or research, including books and films as part of one's individual workday. Creating a more robust separation between work and recreation. And finally, consistent restorative closure practices. These offerings are tools, not rules. Use them when you find that one or more will serve your creative process and your own integrity-based work. Some projects will be better served by some tools than others. 
Ultimately, as physical theater work continues to be in conversation with consent forward practices, we will collectively devise new healthful ways to create. I look forward to doing so with inspiring artists and educators as we continue to build a creative and human focused field together. <laughs> I couldn't help the pun. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It is a true honor to get to introduce to you um, Dr. Aisha Mackey Stevenson, who is the reason why we are all here today. Dr. Aisha is an actor, scholar, activist, intimacy director, dancer, poet, and award-winning writer from Brooklyn, New York. With an MFA from CalArts and a PhD from UMass Amherst, she uses theater and performance to investigate pleasure, sexuality, and human rights. Her critical and creative work appears in Rutledge, Black Camera, Qualitative Inquiry, Boston University Press, International Review of Qualitative Research, Theater Topics, HowlRound, and Research and Drama Education. Dr. Aisha has directed or intimacy directed productions at the Huntington, Fresh Ink Theater, Jewel Box Theater in New York, uh, in NYC Arts at the Armory, Somerville, the Rockwell, and the DC Black Theater and Arts Festival. She is an assistant professor of performance studies and women's studies at Xavier University of Louisiana. Dr. Aisha. Oh, thank you so much. I love the way you read, Colleen. It's so beautiful. And <laughs> I'm just sitting here like getting butterflies as I listen to you and uh, Marie reading. And I'm wondering, I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, actually, everyone, these are both my mentors, <laughs> which, of course, I already knew, but just being sort of intentional about the butterflies. Um, I explained a little, about, a little bit about Marie earlier and, like, my first long intensive at Eugene O'Neill and how she was a teacher there. And Colleen, I assisted her and Claire um, in Boston, Stage Source, um, intimacy workshop I think this was just before the pandemic and you know when they called me I was like oh, it was my first <laughs> it was my first gig and um so I've just uh, learned so much uh from Colleen uh from both of you so thanks so much for that introduction and yeah I feel like going along the lines of what Colleen was talking about uh you know discussing white supremacy and power I'm going to, it works nicely with the chapter that I'm going to read from, which is chapter 13, and it's building a feature of justice and consent. Start every project with, how can this work and white supremacy? Let me tell you a little story of why this intention is important. I was asked to intimacy direct for Hurricane Diane at the Huntington Theater in 2021. When I first met with the director, Jenny Coons, hi Jenny, love you. <laughs> I loved her immediately. The first question she had for me about the play was, how can we use this work here to end white supremacy? Just like that, out of nowhere. Like the play was about slavery or something and it totally wasn't. I was like, whoa, and hell yes, <laughs> let's do this. I knew immediately that this was going to be a journey that I wanted to be a part of. On the surface, the story didn't seem to have anything to do with race. In the suburbs of the Garden State, the Greek god Dionysus returns from the heavens in the guise of a butch gardener named Diane who's hell-bent on reversing climate change and restoring earthly order by seducing a band of mortal followers. So yeah, suburbs and climate change and oh, sex, godly sex. Yet in line with our objective to end white supremacy, Coons also asked me to do a racial justice workshop at the beginning of my work with the actors, the afternoon of the very first rehearsal. I did it on power and privilege. From the feedback I received, this helped the cast to treat each other kindly 
and to work with each other in ways that made them intentional about reducing harm. In the cast, there were a few actors who identified as BIPOC and they welcomed this racial justice approach. This play may not have been about race, but the people in it were going back to their neighborhoods, their schools and elsewhere in the Boston area to spend time with their children, to interact with BIPOC people, to work as directors in community theater. The workshop held helped to really create a language of justice in the room and beyond that matters. Kuhn did not have to do this. She did not have to use her power for good. In the play, only one of the suburban women was cast as Black. When her story reaches its climax, climax, she too will succumb to the whims of Dionysus and she can't. It's clear from the character's dialogue up until this point, she wants Dionysus and she wants them to want her. Dionysus plays uh, non-binary in, uh, in the play. And you can see, she just revels here. If you can see that uh, she's on the, she's on the left, Dionysus is on the right, but she just kind of revels in the joy of getting to have Dionysus, right? Of getting to have an experience with Dionysus. Dionysus definitely wants her, yet they must be invited. The black actress's line to the Greek God to take her is tear me apart. As I was choreographing this scene, I shared with Coons that this did not have to be a moment of angry black woman even though a black woman was cast in this role. Holmes agreed wholeheartedly. I explored a range of emotions with the character. I landed on asking the actor to further explore the joy in those words, tear me apart. Tear me apart. <laughs> in those words and in this moment, where her character is finally going to get what she wants. We explored the flirtatious and teasing tones possible with the scene and made it more exciting, playful, and nuanced, which worked with the comedy scene. So yes, start every theater project with how can this work end white supremacy? Consent cannot be understood without understanding power. Although Hurricane Diane was not explicitly about race, it's important to remember that white supremacy is the water, not the shark. White supremacy is the power in the US that impacts us all. If it can be seen and named, then it can be resisted and subverted in everything that we do. We have to use every opportunity we have to use intimacy, directing, for its intended good. The two biggest barriers to this objective are white supremacy and sexism. And the former makes the latter grossly worse for BIPOC people around the world. Race and sexuality are always in conversation. Therefore, the tandem question is, how can we use this project to end sexism and sexist oppression? Consent is a powerful tool to end sexism and sexist oppression. By the way, you know, if we just think of Bell Hooks for a second, uh, may she rest in peace. This is how she defined feminism, right? Uh, she wants us to clean our minds of some of the, you know, negative connotations we've heard of, of feminism. Feminism, quite simply, is the process, is the participation to end sexism and sexist oppression. That's it. Um, and everyone should want this. Consent is liberation. Consent comes from justice and is inextricably linked to racial and gender revolution. Consent is freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, specific, pride. 
Consent is an agreement to participate in any said activity. The person receiving the action must give consent. Consent is a way that we can acknowledge our joys, transform our trauma, listen to each other, and respect people's bodies. We can't control our past, but we can create art. We can create a world with consent where we are allowed to control what happens to our bodies in theater. Gone are the days when the actor is told to just go and work out a kissing scene, leaving the theater feeling violated that their partner just stuck his tongue down her throat. If that happens to you, then say something. If that happens to someone you know, say something. Give them this book. Let's be visionary and end the violence. In this chapter, I speak to the future of building and sustaining intimacy directing and consent practices that nourish and bring justice to our classrooms and rehearsal rooms. Knowing that our silence will not protect us, Audre Lord, is the first step in being present with integrity and building spaces where we're all included and heard. What does a future of consent look like? Well, it means we have tools to navigate the revolution of intimacy direction that has surged the field of theater and other modes of performance, and we use them. Know when to hire a professional, why consent matters, and the importance of consent workshops. The institution of academia has such an impact on the field of live performance and film. For many young artists, academia shapes their foundational experience. Let's stop blaming the institution and recognize and act upon our roles and powers within it. Teachers are artists and artists are also teachers. Let's work together and lead together and build together. Actors are human beings. Shout out to Claire Warden there, my mentor. She used to always say that and it just blew my mind. It's so obvious yet I just don't feel like we're always intentional about that statement. Actors are human beings and consent is not a chore. It's a process to acknowledge and understand our humanity. This book is for teachers, teachers who are artists and artists who are teachers, because at some point or another, most artists are put in the position to lead. We will not learn to cultivate a space that is safe and intersectional overnight, but respecting students' race, gender, sexual orientation, and other integral modes of identity is a great start. Once we can collectively see actors as human beings, asking for consent, seeking consent will become second nature. Cultivating a space is about changing our minds about the binaries of yes and no. It's about realizing that no, it's not about the person receiving, but all about the person saying it, what they need, what they want. So no, if someone tells you no, don't make it about you. They're saying no because they need to say no. They feel the need to say no. No is an expression of what they need, what they want, what they desire for where they are right now in this human journey, in their human journey. Allow yourself to let go of the negative connotations around no and allow it to be a door that can lead us deeper into true intimacy, a place where we can show up as our authentic selves and be honest about our needs. 
allowing yourself the grace to say no in your own life will help you to teach others this practice. A future of consent means recognizing that actors are human beings and being intentional about that knowledge. Stop compartmentalizing justice. Recognize that all artists are human beings and that neither I nor you are superior to any other human being, even if we make better choices in some circumstances. This book puts forth intimacy work that is based in human rights and consent for everyone as an act of resistance against the fragmentation of justice. You know, all too often, you know, there's a book, a theater book, and it's like, oh, uh, you know, this one, there's a chapter on justice. <laughs> you know, there's a chapter on how do we, how do we deal with race, gender, you know, ability, disability, all neurodivergence, all in one chapter or something like that, right? So I think what's really beautiful about this book, um, and thanks again to the contributors, uh, really is the fact that the entire book is grounded in racial and gender justice, all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we're coming from that space, the practice that we do is going to illustrate that. The future of consent is grounded in racial justice. The future of consent is grounded in gender justice. That means giving black and BIPOC people credit when you take workshops from them and then write journal articles or trainings based upon what we've taught you. That means not talking about power, race, and intersectionality in ways that don't honor the fact that Black feminism and Black critical theory has done that work for you, for all of us. That means recognizing your privilege, acknowledging that it has done damage to others, and actively working to end white supremacy in your classroom, artistic spaces, and beyond. That means loving yourself enough to know and show up as if you belong in the room and at the table. That means not questioning someone's blackness and allowing black to be and mean many things. That means loving our brothers and sisters who are lesbian, gay, bi, transgender, and more fully without trying to change them or make them think that they can't be all they want to be, including black and gay. That means no, it will never be enough until women are running the world. <laughs> it's our turn. <laughs> that means that actors are not here to serve you, but that art is here to serve them. Us and our humanity and our ability to be good to each other. That means realizing that a black woman led us to intimacy directing and that matters. Tarana Burke. And more women and men and all of us can break the silence around violence and harm. The more we can communicate what we want and what we don't want, the more we create spaces where we are free to love ourselves and receive love from others, is the closer we are to feeling and knowing that liberation is already here. We are all in this together and we are all out there doing the work in our classrooms and rehearsal rooms. Intimacy directing may be a new field, but it has clear intentions. This book is to acknowledge the ambitious and necessary intersectionality of the field and honor the roots that intersectionality and black feminist theory and activism have. The intention for intimacy direction to open doors for consent and end sexual violence against women, men, and non-binary people is a human rights legacy. May we all have the courage to make consent so important in our classrooms and rehearsal rooms that no one will have to break the silence and say me too. Intimacy directors are advocates. Intimacy direction is advocacy. An intimacy director assumes the responsibility of holding the room and caring for the safety of the actors and everyone else in it. To do this work on any level carries the responsibility of advocating for others as whole persons, as Marie Percy put earlier. This book is in no way a replacement for an intimacy director. Nothing can replace a highly trained intimacy director in your classroom, 
in your rehearsal room. Without a highly trained intimacy director, the potential for harm is too great. Yet, basic intimacy training serves us all. And I'm, I'm so happy that you're reading this book and that you're here with us today, no matter where you are in your journey. Know that you are reading, that know that you reading this can make a difference. Change is possible with collective action. As artists and as teachers and artists, let us be reminded of and live by the sacred Yoruba text of West Africa, the Odu Ifa. The fundamental meaning and mission of human life is to constantly bring good into the world and not let any good be lost. The fundamental meaning and mission of human life is to constantly bring good into the world and not let any good be lost. If we do this, if we all start every theater project with, how can this work bring good into the world? How can this work end white supremacy? How can this work end sexism? How can this work make women feel good about their bodies? How can this work uplift LGBTQ plus community? Then imagine our classrooms, our country, our world in just a year, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. The thought of this fills me with hope and joy and I'm sending it all your way. Let's make justice contagious. Let's make consent contagious. Love and light, Dr. Aisha. Okay. Oh, just getting that. <laughs> oh, beautiful people. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Oh, so excited. Look how excited we are. You need the book, clearly. <laughs> Look at us. <laughs> We're so excited. Okay, so we would love to open up for questions. And so uh, hopefully you've been putting them into the web chat. Um, and so we'll give Emily uh, a little time to post questions into the chat box. Uh, but I just wanted to give us, take this opportunity to give a shout, uh, shout out. And just knowing that, you know, this book is uh, great on, on, I think many levels, but one of them is, you know, it also traces the history of the field. Um, and so again, Toronto Burke, Me Too Movement, I have to give a, a shout out here to Tonya uh, Sina, okay? Uh, just your work on curriculum and intimacy uh, really was so foundational to this field. And so thank you, thank you. Um, and um, some of the chapters that I think are, we have so many amazing chapters here, but I just wanted to share some of them with you. We have a letter from the director explaining why it's important for directors to just welcome intimacy directors, coordinators, and choreographers. Um, we have a chapter uh, from student, student actor, um, on why intimacy work is important and what they need. So this is really great for listening. If you just want to learn more about what student, your students need, your actors need. We have uh, chapters on, you know, not colorblind choreographing, intimacy directing and human rights, gender queer intimacy, uh, of course, consent culture and devised work. We heard from that Colleen today, staging violence is in here. Um, also virtual intimacy, uh, do's and don'ts of intimacy. We also have a whole chapter that gives definitions, okay? And a whole chapter just on resources. So this is a uh, generally, I think a great resource um, to get your hands on. Okay, where are we with the... Uh... Okay, great. Well, Marie and Colleen, is there uh, anything as we're waiting for questions, comments, is there anything that you'd like to uh, share or say that you're feeling in the moment? <laughs> uh, I was just listening to you off screen. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. I was doing the same thing when you, I was, <laughs> I was like, yeah. I don't even need coffee. I'm just like, I just need an intimacy reading and I'm just like, you know, <laughs> going excited. Yeah, yeah, because I think that, I think that, you know, your chapter is really, I think that is really critical just because just knowing how to meet the student where they are, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and allowing them to be where they are that, you know, you can't force them to be where they're not. <laughs> so, so your options are to either try to force them to be where they're not, or just be where they are with them and figure out the way forward with them. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Well, I have a question um, as we wait to hear more from uh, out there. I do have a question. I was wondering how for con uh, contributors, how was this process for you of, you know, just being the fabulous, uh, you know, you're out there doing the work as artists and then, you know, you were asked to write a chapter. How was the process for you both ways in terms of it informing your work and vice versa? I found it really useful for my work to have the task of doing the introspection and kind of putting together the pieces of what's been working in real time um, and specifically to be called into an invitation to create tools. Um, it really helped me wrap my mind around what I've learned from other practitioners and what has been developed in collaboration with other folks, um, as well as things I've, I've created myself um, for various processes. And it's given me a stronger sense of uh, what those pieces are and how they can come together to serve. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm such a like, I like to write and I like to think about things. And, and so, you know, as soon as you sent me this, this request, um, I was like, yeah, this sounds amazing. And part of it was like, oh, and we have to have citations, you know, you gotta cite your work. And I immediately was like, oh, what am I gonna cite? I gotta, and I, <laughs> I immediately was like, okay, I need to go find the books and the resources so that I can do a better job of naming and honoring the lineage of some of the things that I'm doing. Um, and so that required a level of rigor that I had not previously done. Um, so that was a really wonderful way in which this project called me in and called me up um, to be able to do that within the chapter. Um, and and then I wrote way too much. <laughs> and Dr. Aisha was like, you gotta, you gotta, we gotta cut it back. It's too, and I was like, okay, okay. Um, so the editing process was a little excruciating, um, but, but I'm just so happy with how it came out and happy to be included. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I really didn't want to have to ask you that because you know when something it was just like there and it was it's beautiful fine. and it was all great. But you know, um, yeah, it's so <laughs> I was like, no. Uh it's hard to cut down a, a great piece. Um, so but I think you did a great job of really keeping the um it's succinct, you know, really keeping the the heart of it while cutting off some pieces. And I think we have a, a question here. I'm gonna get to the question, but I also want to share mine too. And um it was really a journey for me with this book because it really made me um, think about where the mistakes I've made. <laughs> it really made me think about, you know, where I am now compared to um, when I first started doing, you know, and as Claire Ward, oh, she always says we're, we should always be learning, right? But um, there were just things I did before I had any, any intimacy training um, that I just, you know, looking back after <laughs> after training and after certification that I was like, oh gosh, oh yeah, don't leave actors alone, stuff like that, um, that, you know, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. And so, and um, I remember in the student chapter, uh, she said, oh, you know, but this is, you know, I felt like um, I needed more direction or I this or that. And she said, you know, I don't want to talk about that. She was like, you're the editor. I was like, no, I need you to be honest and talk about that. <laughs> I need you to talk about that because that's a part of what I'm trying to show right? Is that we have to, we have to self-reflect, we have to do the work and we have to learn and realize that we've made mistakes and that harm is inevitable, but how can we reduce, right? How can we reduce, you know? So, um, so yeah, it was a really good reflective process for me. And so Carlin says, I love this work. Can you all speak to how this work can be done in other disciplines? Mm, both in the classroom 
and or in other performance settings. Who would like to go for this one? Oh, both, I'd love to hear from both of you. All right, I'll 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 go first. Um, how this work can be done in other disciplines in the classroom. So when I am in the classroom, this work is informing everything I'm doing. <laughs> there is there is no piece of me as an artist that is left unchanged from doing this work, studying this work and implementing this work. Um, and I think a really important part of bringing this work to any project is having done the internal work, the like internal introspection of like, how do the cultural norms of entertainment, how have they affected me? How, what are the things that I just take for granted as normal that actually, we don't have to do it that way, actually. There, we, we can figure out another way to do it. We can be creative and compassionate and find other ways. Um, and so, so that's a really big thing for me because you know, to, to Dr. Aisha's like call of like, how can this project end white supremacy? How can this project end sexism? And I think part of that is, is ending it in yourself first, right? Because we're all cultured and, and brought up in the swimming pool of white supremacy and sexism and the various other isms that negatively impact people. And, and yeah, like doing, once you do that and really start to dig into that, it changes everything about how you show up and how you do things. Um, I have no idea if that actually answers your question or not. Um, but that's, that's my first stab at it. Yeah. <laughs> it's tricky. Um, Cause it's broad and wonderful. Um, I think what I'm thinking of first is um, what you wrote, Dr. Aisha, throughout this book, and particularly in, in the chapter that you read, is the full-throated way in which you speak to how consent work in general and intimacy work in particular cannot and should not be parsed out from other vital anti-oppression work. Um, and I think that for me, that really lifts what is essential about all of it and the way that I also have had the experience that engaging with this material has shifted every way that I move through spaces, um, deeply, imperfectly, and constantly in, um, in an attempt to move towards deeper understanding of these principles. Um, so everything from, you know, uh, when I'm, you know, teaching second graders in a theater class to even just how I show up in uh, in my family life um, and ways in which thinking about both consent and the impacts of oppressive systems on consent, um, that, 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 uh, that that study and that uh, an engagement with those ideas has also really impacted so much of the way I move through the world. And I take in information and attempt to um, share information out. So that's what strikes me. I would love to throw to you, Dr. Aisha, because it really was so well captured in that chapter. Yeah, I just, <laughs> yes, to, yes, to what both of you are saying. And I just, I just have to go back to that eight day intensive at Eugene. <laughs> oh my gosh, it just, you know, I can't go back. It just changed my life. Um, and just, I feel like it's a paradigm. Like you both were saying, it's just like, for me, it's just like a world, a way of seeing the world now. And so it's just a part of everything that I do. It's a part, it's, it's my work as an artist. It's also like, you know, what, what, you know, what I'm doing in the classroom. It doesn't matter if I'm teaching a theater class or not. Like so much of this work has also been, um, my feminist theory step class, we're talking about that stuff. So I think, I just feel like, you know, this idea of making consent and justice contagious, I just feel like we need to put it on everything and put it everywhere, right? I mean, and it's more and more becoming, you know, part of Title IX conversations and, right? This is just so connected to everything that we do um, and to the fact that we just really, 
we just really need to love women. I just, I just really, we, this, this world really, really, really needs to love women more. We need to love ourselves and everyone more, but we just really, really do. And I think that consent work is one of those tools of freedom that once you start doing this work, it just ends up just trickling into every part of your life. And it's really, it's so liberating. It really is. Yeah. Thank you for that so, question. And, and just to like piggyback off what you're saying, I love this. I love the phrase you use tool of liberation because I feel like so sometimes people are really confronted by it and they're afraid it's going to be constraining. And it's, and it's, it's not about constraining or holding back. It's about shifting and approaching with a new paradigm and a new, um, just a new set of parameters, right? And that those, that new parameter is actually going to allow everybody to do better work. And we're, and, and this is one of the things like I'm really passionate about, like, if you are an artist, you are already a creative problem solver. And so including consent in your process isn't about like throwing a monkey wrench in the, you know, throwing a wrench in the works and gumming everything up. It's about actually just, okay, if there a no comes up, we're going to use our creative problem solving skills to move forward and, and work through it. And, and if you're an artist, you already have those skills. It's just a new type of problem that you're learning how to engage with and frankly, like be excited about tackling. I love a no. I love a no. Cause when I get a no, I'm like, okay, this person's being honest with me. I feel more relaxed and able to trust them. And then it's like, let's go. Yes. <laughs> I love that. I, I, I would talk to my students. It was, I just said, listen, if you're not saying no, are you being honest? Oh, seriously, it's, and we, we, we just had this conversation. Just think back to your relationships and those relationships where you just felt just okay to just say no. Um, what kind of relationships were there? those relationships where you felt like there was where there was trust, you could really communicate, you could and I said that's intimacy, right? That's intimacy to be able to say no and just be held in that, right? And be supported in that. Um, yeah. So let's see. Well, you know, sometimes people, I know we have a lot of viewers watching. I think sometimes people just love to listen to, and I totally um, hear that as well. Do y'all have any questions for me or? Oh, I would love to hear more about um, how your, like, oh gosh. I don't know what are the what are the really some of the exciting practices or things that you've developed that have come out of your social justice work meeting your intimacy direction work and the way that they it all needs to come together like do you have do you have like a couple I don't know bullet point tips or tricks for folks that that you really I know I I just gave the most non specific answer in the world, but now I'm asking you for something, but I'm just, I would love to hear you riff more on that. <laughs> like, uh, so some of the work that I've developed that's come out of this work, right? Yeah, yeah. Some of the practices that has come out of you really putting the social justice with the intimacy direction together and what's come out of that for you. Yeah, so I think it's a great question. So I feel like, um, you know, originally, um, when I was doing um, intimacy direction, um, this was at um, the Huntington, and it was for our daughter's like pillars, uh, which is about a black family that like goes up to New Hampshire, just like <laughs> everything, you know, everything about the, the family's together and all of a sudden everything just comes out, right? Um, and it, it was so fun because I never really got to, uh, it was the first time that uh, as an ID that I got to work with um, an all black cast and just work on um, a black story about love and family. And so I remember like during break, um, one of the actresses, this older, beautiful lady, and she said, oh, you know, I really would love to chat if you have a minute. I said, of course. So we went into the hallway and 
we were talking and we were just like there in the stairway. <laughs> I talk about, I write about it in the book too, but we were there in the stairway and just, you know, the way that the light was hitting her face, you could just see just every line in her face. And it was just the, 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 just the, the, be the beauty. It was just so, she was just so um, old and beautiful, quite frankly. And she said, you know, all my years, she said, I have never seen black love on stage, you know? Um, and when she said that, I was just like, oh my gosh, we're just like in the hallway. I'm just like, cause I realized I was like, neither had I all these years that, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, right? And my sister used to take me into the city. Is I really get excited. My first show was Muppet Babies, and then it got more more mature after that. <laughs> but um, like all this time, all these years, seeing all different types of theater, I've seen you know so many stories about pain and historical stories. But I all I had never seen um, black love, and so yeah. To answer your question, that really is what got me thinking more intentionally about not just racial justice with this work, but in particular, just the importance of how um, the representation of Black sexuality really impacts us, can really impact us. And something like that, which just feels so missing, can be such a source of pain. And I said, oh, so from there, I was like, okay, this is not just about me choreographing a hug or a kiss, right? And it's even beyond the point of representation, but this is really a human rights issue. It really, really is. Um, because, you know, how you are, how you are represented is the way that you're going to be treated. And I ha I remember having another viewer on a similar Howl Round talk. I was doing a Howl Round talk on intimacy directing and Black love, and she and she just said, you know, I don't even know if Black people if we if do we do we even know how to touch each other. You know, it's just like we don't even see that gentleness, right? So it's like it's building that imagination, um, as well. And so that really got me to start, um looking at sort of the relationship between intimacy directing and human rights, right? So I did this chapter on um, intimacy directing race and human rights, but I think, you know, we don't often think about the fact that uh, sexual, not, not, our, not only our sexual rights, human rights, but sexual rights just aren't, you know, the normal, the maybe typical rights that we think of. It's also the right to be uh, represented in multiple ways. It's also the right to see um, people in the image of you um, loving each other, being vulnerable with each other, right? These are aspects of that as well. Um, and so in this chapter, I do give, you know, some tips, right, uh, on ways to explore human rights in this kind of work, right? Like, uh, for example, you, some of the things that you do provide human rights access to actors by providing information and education. And this deals with um, chap, uh, Article 26, everyone has the right to education. Letting the actors know who you are, what your role is, what their rights are as students. Um, the right to be free from torture to cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment has to do with Article Third, Article 5, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, inhuman or degrading treatment or, or punishment. Um, and this, this really goes to, I think, to the heart of uh, not just doing consent and choreography that is, uh, cons not just recognizing that consent is fluid and that choreography is repeatable, but also that like, what are the ways in which we can choreograph that does not, um, even if the character is being degraded, the human is not being degraded, right? So, and then I go to like the Ubuntu healing circles. I've started to get into that as a way for, because one of the things I realized is that people of color, BIPOC people, um, often we sometimes just feel we talk about just feeling invisible in um, some artistic and theater spaces. And so the Ubuntu Healing Circle activity is uh, really great. 
um, Ubuntu, you know, meaning collective, is really great because um, it just starts off with everyone in the circle um, acknowledging that the uh, that other that another person in the circle is present. So, um, someone says like, you know, um, uh, I would say for example, Marie, I see you, and you would say, I am here, right? And so. Um, and these are just ways that, like, again, you were talking about sort of the, and Polly was talking about the, hum the humanness of it all. It's just the way human to human, um, in particular for, uh, for everyone, but for BIPOC people, to make sure that BIPOC people are recognized and feel um, visible in this space. So I, I think that the human rights work is probably what I'm most uh, proud of in terms of actual, you know, tips and strategies that I could sort of um, lay out. Um, but I think most recently, the work that I've been doing with um, choreographing, choreographing interracial uh, romance has been really exciting. Um, and that came from, again, a responder just saying, oh, you know, I am an actor and as a black uh, woman actor, I don't even know how to approach a scene. It doesn't even have to be romantic. I don't even know how to approach a scene with a white male actor, right? Um, so doing that work has been really exciting too because you have to get it. So there's so much there's so much violence and there's so much happening outside of the room that in the room, um, getting them to see each other as human and getting them to be vulnerable and, and, and allowing them the space to trust each other is so, so critical. So that was a really long answer <laughs> to your question. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. <laughs> oh, it was fabulous. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay. And so, well, I have, um, I, ha I have a question actually. I'm wondering because um, I know that we're dealing here with, um, so we have this idea of um, actor training um, and consent, and then also consent culture and advice work. I was wondering, um, and maybe Colleen can speak to this a little bit more, but uh, it's up to you both. But I was wondering, where do you all see uh, trauma with the work that you do? I just, the, these questions, uh, whether or not it's being asked right now, people are always asking about that and how we deal with that <laughs> in, in the room, yeah. Yeah, I think speaking just for myself um, and very much based on, um, you know, following in, in the footsteps of what Claire Warden was was and is doing in terms of um, her own research around the uh, the ways in which embodied physical work can be in conversation with trauma histories. Um, that's something that I've I've felt is a a real central part of my approach to the work from the beginning, um, not just in terms of responding in a moment if someone is activated, although certainly that is an important part of it, but also I think the really revelatory piece of, of training and learning um, that I have found from trauma-informed work specifically is that trauma-informed work is really as I actually believe consent work is as well, um, an accessibility issue. And that when someone is intentional as a facilitator about the fact that we as humans have experienced various traumatic instances in our life, uh, you know, um, both systemically or, or one-off events or things that are repeating in someone's life or intergenerational, um, and we don't know what those specifics are um, with our colleagues that we're working with, nor is it our job to ask. Um, but by being aware of the impact of trauma in our world, that we as facilitators in whatever role that is, whenever we find ourselves in a position where we're, um, that where we have an element of uh, leadership, that being intentional about Frankly, choice is a big piece of it um, in terms of how individuals engage with material allows more people to access whatever the creative project is or whatever the educational space is. Um, I used to say regardless of their trauma history and I've been searching around for a better word um, in relationship to the way that their trauma history impacts 
their own um, today body. Um, and uh, so for me, the two are really deeply intertwined um, trauma trauma work as a non mental health practitioner, but just as a lay person engaged with um, with the ideas of how um, trauma not always does, but can land physically and show up again later when other stimulus comes in that's reminiscent of early events um, feels really important when it comes to um, telling any stories, but frankly, particularly telling stories that might be sensitive um, as a lot of our work is. So, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm gonna add a few things, which is, I think when you're, when you're thinking about trauma informed work, rule number one is just assume it's in the room, right? Just like show up and assume that somebody in the room at some point in their lives has experienced an adverse life event. Um, and so, so that's kind of like the first thing for me, it's like, okay, it's in the room somewhere. We can just acknowledge that and know and be proactive moving forward. Um, and then the other framing that I think is really helpful. So when we're thinking about trauma, it's impacting the nervous system, right? So it's impacting the way the nervous system is interacting with the world and how the nervous system is responding to particular stimuli. Um, and so this is not a perfect metaphor, but it's kind of a fun metaphor, um, which is if you if you think about sort of like a smoke alarm. And and, you know, I've lived in places where you put a toast in the toaster and like just the tiniest little thing of of smoke comes off right and the smoke alarm's like beep, beep, beep. Um, and i've also lived in places where you know like i open the oven and it's like whoosh and the smoke alarm doesn't go off right so like it when you're thinking about trauma part of the definition of trauma is that these are difficult events that are difficult to speak about and categorize. But if you can think about it as, okay, everybody in this room has a different kind of smoke detector. Some of these smoke detectors are gonna be a little bit more sensitive than the other smoke detectors or, or a little bit more attuned to particular uh, things in the air. Um, and, then it's, and then it's like, I don't need to know what's burning in the oven I don't have to ask you those personal questions. We don't have to get into what the trauma is. You can go open your oven with your therapist and get treatment if you want, or you can just let the cookies in your oven keep burning and live your life that way too. Um, that's not for me to decide, but, but then it's just like, okay, somebody's cookies are burning and the smoke alarm is going off. What do we, we let's open a window, let's turn the fan on, Let's push the little button on the smoke detector to get a little reset going, and then we can move on. And when you start to think of it as just like a, a it's a system that's maybe working suboptimally around certain stimuli, then it's just like, okay. Lot, I feel like it's a lot less scary when you think about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Before we move past it, I would love just to share um, yes. this book uh, by, Alex Shervin Bennett, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, Equity-Centered Trauma-Informed Education. Mm -hmm. um, in my walk through trauma-informed work, I definitely encountered some problematic approaches. Um, and so I wanted to really lift uh, some of the thought leaders who are, who are keeping equity at the center of their work um, because it's something that if it's if it's not approached much in the same way that we were talking about consent work right if if anti-racism isn't at the core of what we're doing because of the because white supremacy is so in the water it it will show up in a harmful way and i think it's very true for trauma-informed work as well um and so this is one resource that i found to be really good and it is pretty classroom i mean it is it is specifically classroom oriented um, so I wanted to share that as well with this particular group of folks. That's wonderful. And I just wanted to put uh, it in the chat box and perhaps Emily could share it with uh, with folks so they could just uh, see 
who the author is and thank you for that resource. And so I I love the analogy there too, Marie. And so what does does anyone want to share any practical tips in terms of like what you do if like someone's smoke alarm was really going off, like the cookies were burning? Yeah. So there's like a five, four, three, two, one protocol, which is really useful, right? So it's like ask them to point and name five things they can see, four things they can feel, three things they what's the next one? Is it here? and then smell and then t one thing they can taste. Yeah. Um, and so like leading something that just actually helps them interact with what is true in the present moment in their senses. That's a that's a really like quick and easy. Anybody can kind of do that one, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something else that was really um, useful for me to reckon with as somebody who very much wants to fix and make things better <laughs> um, is that not all the time, um, but often, especially when we're working with adults, as we are with consent work, um, individuals will have a sense of what works for them when they're experiencing um, activation. And so the simple practice that has you know been in the zeitgeist for a long time in the consent world of saying, hey, what do you need right now? with uh, paying attention to my own, like where my own breath and voice is living, right? Because there is that idea of like, uh, we can we sometimes mirror each other, right? So making sure that I'm coming in in uh, an energy that is hopefully a useful place to perhaps match towards, but also at the same time, not assuming that I necessarily know what the fix is, but that I can offer space and and offer a particular practice or um or just time away um and and trusting trusting adults to be able to tell us what those needs are even when they're activated um because uh, you know if you're imagining a zero through 10 scale like even up at like eight and nine most adults will be able to verbally or physically let you know like what they need right now which might be like contact or might be space right and um so uh as is often the case like for me it was resisting the impulse to constantly like be the firefighter and save the day um but be willing to be open to um to what needs actually are in addition to having some offerings myself. Um, so that was really, that all, that often takes a while um, with advocacy work, I, certainly for me, and it's an ongoing thing um, to know that I don't always have the answer, but that I can still show up in a way that is, um, that can, that can help hold space in a useful way when it's in a listening stance. Yes. Powerful, powerful. Okay, so we're at uh, 2.28 now. And so I thought this would be a great time to give our thank yous, uh, give our thank yous. I love how this turned into an artist talk and just just, just, just listening to you uh, both and having these conversations, it's just so beautiful. I really wanna thank the contributors. Uh, thank you so much for your words, your stories, your strategies, your tips, um, your knowledge, just... Um, yeah, it's really just been an honor and a pleasure to work with you. Uh, I want to thank my husband, Carlin, my mom, Brian, all my friends and family. I feel like I'm on the Apollo. Just like, shout out to everyone. <laughs> I grew up in the 80s and 90s. So anyway, okay, Apollo was up. Um, HowlRound, BJ, Emily, thank you so much. And you, I want to thank everyone out there who's just really trying to build a better world uh, with their art practice and thank you for supporting our work uh thank you for being with us today and um marie and colleen would you like to say any thank yous or no pressure <laughs> i i mean i didn't have one plan but thank you for for being the spearhead of this particular project um you know this it's a beautiful book and and thank you for conceiving of it and doing all the hard editing and running after people to get their manuscripts and you know all the work that you put in to make this book a reality um it's it's a it's a beautiful thing thank you thanks so much marie you're welcome thank you for that um similarly but just in my own words um dr aisha what you've put into put into the the larger world is something that i think we're going to be seeing the impact of 
indefinitely. Um, your words today um, really capture so much of what has gone into this work in terms of you pulling together your lived experience and your deep expertise, um, in addition to being generous enough to, to invite others of us into this, this wider conversation. Um, and so as a, as a human being and as a professional, I am deeply grateful um, for all of your work and specifically the fact that you've been able to share it widely like this. Um, so thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I love you both. And as, co as my colleagues and my mentors, again, I'm just honored. Thank you. Thank you for your work as well. And who else do we want to thank? Buy a book. <laughs> Buy a book. Follow us on IG. Stalk us a little bit. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, be the change that you want to see in the world, everyone. Okay, why don't you want to join us with a little tap out? Okay, everyone, till next time. Bye.